Hello. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. And welcome to the second live uh, session organized by LE Publishing. Um, as you might know already, uh, I am Silvia, the marketing manager here at, uh, um, in LE Publishing. And before giving the floor to our dear speaker, uh, Andre Edlund, thanks for being here, Andre, by the way, um, I would like to share some. Um, some technical information with you regarding this uh, live event, live workshop. So first thing, I know you are all interested in the certificate. So you will be receive a certificate of attendance by tomorrow evening. It will be released in a PDF format. And please do remember to check your email inbox by tomorrow evening about this time, let's say. Um, also, um, thanks to our speaker, uh, it's available for you under documents. There's a like a um, in the menu. There's a documents. You should click on it, and then the menu scroll down, and you will find a PDF. So our speaker put together a sort of a handout for you to download before the end of the session, and to keep with you for your archive, archive your study, or to share with your colleagues as well. But please remember to download it before the end of the session, otherwise then it will, it will be impossible to, um, to, to have it on your screen, on your desktop, okay? Uh, then, uh, this webinar will be recorded, and uh, please remember to follow us, to follow Ellie Publishing on Facebook, because we will be mentioning, we will be launching the recorded video in the next few weeks. So, make sure to follow, to put a like on uh, Facebook, uh, Ellie Publishing, in the next few weeks, you will receive, you will be a knowledge about, you know, the recorded video. And uh, questions and answers. Yes, there will be a moment dedicated to questions and answers at the end uh, of the session of the workshop. Uh, feel free to write down any comments, queries, questions you might have during the session and at the end of the session. We'll be happy for you to read them uh, to André. There's a limitation, there's a limit in the, with this platform that you won't be able to read all the other participants comments i will be reading them so no worries if you uh if you don't see if you don't read the others ones okay i will be like sitting here silently at the back uh of the platform but dealing with any uh issue if if but there won't be any issues actually so i will be here no worries anyway um okay so it's now time to um give the floor to andre edlun he will be giving this session with the title, Making Thinking and Learning Visible. Andre Edlund is based, by the way, in Brazil. Uh, he has a master's degree in psychology of education. He's an education consultant, a speaker, and a lecturer as well. He's a board member of Brazil TESOS, and he writes material, ET materials and uh, articles for different magazines, and in particular, for his website. His website, just for you to know if you want to go and have a look, is andre Hedlund dot com so uh i think that's all for from me and uh thanks andre and uh, it's over to you now thank you very much sylvia it's a pleasure to be here so i wanted to thank you in particular because you were the one who invited me to be here so it's thank a you. privilege and of course ellie publishing because i know how hard you work to make excellent materials for teachers and we all know all the teachers here they really save our lives, right? <laughs> if you have a good book, if you have a good uh, digital platform, you know how amazingly, um, well, let's say how much easier life gets, right? Now, I will be talking about something that I started studying a while ago, and I hope it's something that is interesting for you, especially because I know that this is one of the topics that has become sort of a trend in the last couple of years, I would say even in the last 20 years maybe, you know? If you think about when John Hattie um, published his first visible learning book, so that was back in, uh, I think it was 2009 maybe, uh, and then it became very popular, people started talking about it, but if you go back a little bit uh, further in time, you will find out that learning visible learning was kind of around. People were talking about it using different uh, concepts, maybe different terminology. And if you go back even 30 years, you will find visible thinking somehow. Maybe not with those words, not with those terms, but it was around. 
As a matter of fact, I will be referring to Project Zero by Harvard, and that has been around since 1967, just so you know. So it's not something new, I know that, but I don't think we need to find new stuff all the time. I think it's actually much better many times to make sure that we are doing the old stuff the right way, you know? So we don't have to be revolutionary all the time. But before I even start talking about that, who is this guy anyway? So who is this guy right in front of you talking to you about visible thinking and learning? Well, first of all, I'd like to consider myself, I do like to consider myself a nerd and a geek because I like science very much, but I also like sci-fi and fantasy. So it's something that uh, somehow uh, has inspired me over the years, you know, especially sci-fi, because I can think outside the box, I can travel to different universes and you know, reflect on how things work here. But I'm also a science of learning enthusiast, and this is something that I'm very passionate about. I've been working with this amazing science for a couple of years now, I've just published a book in Portuguese about the science of learning, and I really want teachers to learn more about this. And I, I know that the science of learning is very well aligned with uh, visible thinking and learning. I will tell you how in a minute, <laughs> but if you are not familiar with the science of learning, I beg you, please start looking for anything related to the science of learning. And you, know, you can go to my website, andrea-hadlon.com and you can find a lot of texts there about the science of learning and also follow me on social media because I post a lot of things about the science of learning which can also be referred to in a way as mind brain education so I'm one of the board members of the mind brain education SIG here in Brazil for Brass Tiso and there are many other things that I do but I just wanted to tell you that I'm a trainer I'm a writer I'm a course designer I have three cats and their names are Achilles, Elena, and Cecilia, okay? I'm also friends with Mr. Trunk and Athena. And I'm not going to tell you anything about this right now because I want to make you curious. At the end of the session, I promise I'll, I will introduce you to Mr. Trunk and Athena, okay? I'm also the author of The Owl Factor, Reframing Your Teaching Philosophy. So if you want to know more about my work, please just buy my book or just go to my website and you will read texts about the no show grow framework okay now enough you don't want to know anything about me right you want to know about visible learning and visible thinking so i thought an interesting sequence for us to follow is this one right let's start with backward design and empiricism because i think we need to kind of look at the the end product yes to understand what we want but then we have to kind of um i would say reverse engineer our way back to the beginning the goal to make sure that the end product makes sense right and that has a lot to do with empirical evidence collecting evidence using tools to measure things not just relying on your gut feeling you know because we are biased right but then we are going to talk about visible thinking. We're going to mention a couple of uh, thinking routines here. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, with visible thinking routines. Then I'll give you some concrete examples. I, I will actually refer to some of the books Ellie Publishing makes. And finally, we're going to talk about visible learning. John Hattie is the guy behind visible learning and strategies for your teaching practice. Actually, Actually, the strategies, I will give you some ideas. You can read some texts that I will recommend, but it's on you, you know? So here, I won't give you too many ideas. I think it's more like an invitation for you to learn more about visible teaching and visible learning. How about that? I hope that is interesting. I hope it makes sense. To break the ice a little bit, are you feeling like that? Yes? <laughs> You know, now it's November. I don't know exactly where you're coming from. I cannot see um, the chat because of, you know, it doesn't work like that. But some of you are probably familiar with this scene, right? In particular. So if you are, think, think about it. Where have you seen this? 
Uh, my mom is a huge fan of this movie. She was the one who introduced me to this movie. And I think that kind of represents what we're going through right now. I think a lot of teachers are, especially in Brazil, they're preparing to, you know, uh, have a break to go on holidays or something like that because they're approaching the end of the second semester. So we're going to have a, a big break from December to almost February and then after Carnival. And I think we're basically getting ready to relax, to rest a little bit, right? So I really want, <laughs> I, I hope anyway, that you get the break you deserve, the rest you deserve, because you're all teachers, you are very busy and tired. And in case you didn't know, the answer is uh, Greece, okay? Yes. That's the we answer. Got, we, That's got, we got some answers, some correct answers, yes. Excellent, Sylvia. Wonderful. So that's John Travolta, right? Olivia mm -hmm. Newton John. Remember, such a great yes. movie. And my mom Beautiful. is a huge fan. So that's, <laughs> yes, right? That's how I got introduced to it. That's the end of the movie, almost towards the end of the movie. The ball, you know, it's like prom. And then everybody's excited. Mm -hmm. They're preparing to go on holiday, right? Perfect. I want you to be celebrating like that, hopefully. <laughs> but I also want you to answer this question. And I'm going to ask uh, Sylvia to help me. So I'm going to ask the question. You can say yes, no, give me some uh, evidence that it can or it cannot be assessed. And then I'll show you what I think uh, works. Okay. So do you think, honestly, that learning can be assessed? I mean, learning is a complex thing, right? Can it be assessed really? Because we're not assessing learning the best way we can so please yes or no it depends i'll give you some time and see that you can. yes please just give us some time because there's a little bit of delay since you uh talk and then i write let's wait for she seconds. Yeah. let's just wait it, it might be a tricky question i think a little bit okay <laughs> but some some yeah. Answers are coming in, so yes, learning okay. can be assessed, but it's uh, not easy, or it depends. The learning process, okay. process is hard to assess. Ah, okay, interesting, interesting. I'm sure a lot of people have different ideas, but um, I guess most of us agree that learning is not easy to assess because sometimes when we are assessing learning, we're not really assessing learning, we're assessing performance. What happened on that day because of that tool that we used to assess whether our students have learned or not. And that can be complicated because we don't know exactly where students are in terms mm. of their knowledge, their skills, right? Anything else, Sylvia? Yeah, there's a yeah. Uh, second part of one of the answers I mentioned before. I said, actually, it's very, really yeah. interesting. Um, okay. Then the gain competency, then they are, they can be assessed. So we can actually like, you know, monitor them. Teachers can monitor and see them. And Perfect. Yeah, so there are many ways for us to answer this question. But before we can answer this question, I think we have to have a couple of things clear. And those things are, the first one is that there are certain outcomes students must achieve in their learning experience, you know. So we need to be able to see those outcomes or to assess those outcomes somehow. And those outcomes, though, need to be measured or ascertained based on certain criteria. So my students should be able to get somewhere and I should be able to see that and measure that if they got there uh, pretty easily or if it was hard, how long it took them, if they were able to do everything that was uh, part of this learning experience or not. So if we want to assess learning, we need to have some kind of parameter. We need to have a, an end goal, right? And we need to have a process or protocols in place so we can, you know, make sure that they are doing what they're supposed to do. They're getting where they're supposed to go, right? That's what we have to have in place before we can even start assessing. Well, that makes it a little bit complicated for us to assess our students. And I will get in, uh, into that in a second. But before that, I wanted to give you 
a very interesting framework that some of you may be familiar with. Some, some of you have never heard of this, maybe, but it's called backward design, okay? So let's go back thousands of years, you know, in history, and then think about when civilizations clashed, and then maybe one civilization had a piece of technology that the other one didn't have, right? So how do they learn how to make that technology part of their culture? Because it's useful, right? So this has to do with backward design. It's reverse engineering in a way. So you look at the end product and then you start putting everything apart to see how it works. And then you come up with a process so that you can make something similar or something better even, right? I think we need to take that as a source of inspiration, let's say, or a mindset, if I may say that word. A lot of people don't like to use mindset nowadays, myself included, because, you know, it became a buzzword, I think. But we should be inspired by this interesting idea, Wiggins and Mactide. So think about it. First, first thing we should do to plan and deliver uh, any learning experience is we need to identify desired outcomes, right? So again, where do we want our students to go? to get where exactly, right? Okay, then we have to determine acceptable evidence. How do we know if, if they got there? What will tell us if they got there, right? And finally, we have to plan the learning experiences and everything that comes along, like instructions, for example. So that means that we should actually start the lesson with the outcomes in mind, yeah? And normally we do, right? I mean, when we're planning lessons and when we look at books, it's, you know, the, especially teachers' books, right? They start with, by the end of the lesson, students will be able to, actually it should be more like should be able to because we don't know, right? But anyway, we start with outcomes. Okay, great. But then what kind of evidence is important for us to say, okay, they're getting there. So that has a lot to do with assessment, all right? And we need to see the ev evidence or we need to feel the evidence or to hear the evidence. We need something, right? Otherwise, how can we tell if our students got there or not? And finally, that's how we plan the aims of the lesson. So I think we should do that more often. The big question here is, are you doing that? I don't know. If you are not doing that, how about giving this a try? I know you're still planning lessons, you know? I know you're teaching, so why don't you start like this tomorrow? And then you tell me if it worked or not, okay? Now, why is this very important? Well, because that has everything to do with empiricism. And empiricism has everything to do with the scientific method, right? And I told you, I'm a science of learning enthusiast, right? That means that I really like to look at the evidence. And when we look at the evidence, of course, the evidence needs to be interpreted, right? It's not just looking at the evidence. But when we look at the evidence, we look at concrete, tangible things for us to make decisions. The problem is teaching has been um, sort of an in intuitive profession for years and years. So it's a gut feeling, right? Which can be very, very useful. I'm not saying you shouldn't use your gut feeling, especially if you are a trained teacher qualified, you've been teaching for a very long time, you have this feeling, so go for it, right? But don't go for it over the evidence, you know, because the evidence can show a lot more. So what am I talking about? How can we assess things? We look at the evidence. We look at the scientific method. So the scientific method basically tells us that for us to understand a phenomenon, you know, a natural phenomenon, something that happens in this world, in the universe, we have to be able to look at it or collect evidence, you know, and we have to test it, we have to experiment somehow. And then of course, when we conduct an experiment and we come to a conclusion, we have to be able to test if our conclusion is right. So there's also peer revision, right? And then other people will look at the same experiment. Maybe they will try to replicate that and say, yeah, this actually makes sense. Or maybe it doesn't make that much sense, right? 
So it's evidence-based. We collect evidence. And it's plausible. It's logical thinking. It's not, oh, I collected evidence, but then, you know, this evidence is pointing in this completely irrational, illogical direction because, you know, I feel like it. No, you have to use your reasoning to say, hey, if I have this type of evidence, that means this, probably, because there is a clear connection there. So whenever you collect evidence from your students, it's not I feel like my student has learned or not. It's mu much more like I see what my students have done, I notice that they have done that, and I hear. So you use your senses. That's what we, we do as teachers, you know, action researchers. Our senses are not the best instruments, I'll tell you that, <laughs> you know, because of biases, but it's what we have to work with. So that means that you need to collect certain type of, of data and evidence so that you can make inferences, you can understand what's going on in the classroom. I was just reading, just rereading actually, a couple of days ago, this amazing book by Carl Sagan. I don't know, have you ever read this? The Demon Haunted World. And there is a great, great analogy in chapter 10 about a dragon in the garage. I don't know if you've ever read that, but if someone claims there's a dragon inside their house, in the garage, you know, but there's no way for you to test that, you know, so you say, okay, so let me take a picture. Yeah, but he's invisible. Okay, so let me measure uh, his body heat, heat with uh, in, an infrared sensor. Well, he doesn't have any body heat or, okay, so maybe we can collect evidence from his footprints. We're, we're gonna spread some flour on the floor. Yeah, but he doesn't have a, a, a physical body. <laughs> so if there is no way for you to collect evidence, it's probably not true, you know? So that's how important empirical evidence is. And I'm talking about that for visible thinking and learning because according to Robert Bjork, a cognitive psychologist, performance and learning are different. Performance has to do with what can be observed and measured at the time of taking a test but learning is what sticks with us so even with the scientific method we can test something today and then replicate that it doesn't mean it's going to stay like that forever that's why we keep collecting evidence that's why we have longitudinal studies right things change or maybe we have found better ways to collect evidence or the evidence is more reliable nowadays so what i'm trying to say here is that the way we have been collecting evidence from our students to say they have learned or not is not the best way. <laughs> we have been spending a lot of money, a lot of resources collecting evidence from our students, but then we turn everything into one single number. And then we say they have learned, they have not learned, they have to do everything again, or they can move on to the next level, right? Well, so what can we do? Well, I'll tell you what we can do. <laughs> Hope that's why I'm here, right? Uh, we can think about visible thinking. <laughs> that's the first step. Because, you know, if we learn, that means we thought before. Actually, thinking precedes learning. If you think about it, <laughs> right, it makes sense. It's plausible. First, I think, and when I, when I say think, I'm talking about cognitive processes, you know, like reasoning, uh, paying attention, for example, thinking, paying attention, attention is a cognitive resource, making new memories, you know, working memory, so thinking, so before I can learn anything, I think. So how do I know if my students are actually learning or they're going to learn, because they might not learn right then, but they're going to learn in the near future, how do I know that? Well, if they are thinking throughout the process, when they're doing the task, when they're uh, completing their assignment, when they're talking to you, that probably means they're going to learn, right? If they're not thinking, they're not paying attention, they're not reasoning, they're not making an effort and, uh, you know, a cognitive effort, they are probably not learning. But what is visible thinking? Well, visible thinking is something that comes from this amazing project. Like I said, Project Zero Harvard. It's been around since 1967, okay? So if you have never heard about it, it's high time you heard about it. You can go to the website, Project uh, Zero, 
it was inspired by uh, a philosopher uh, called Nelson Goodman, and he was definitely a good man, a very good man, because he gave us this present here. And nowadays, there are even categories, different types of thinking. And within those categories, we have the most amazing tools that I think teachers are not using systematically or not intentionally anyway. Many times it's just by accident. What am I talking about? I'm talking about visible thinking routines, right? So some of you have heard of it, yes? Some of you may have heard of it, I don't know. <laughs> uh, maybe you've never heard of it, but uh, I mean of them, right? Because there are so many, a lot of different visible thinking routines. But I'm telling you, those visible thinking routines can help uh, structure your students' thought process. If they are thinking, if they are cognitively engaged and committed, that means they are more likely to learn. We have to get them thinking before they can learn. That's the whole point, right? So we talk a lot about visible thinking, but well, actually we talk much more about visible learning. But do we implement those routines? Actually, we do. <laughs> By accident, we do. Even if we don't know what we're doing, we do. How you will prove that to you. I'll give you some examples, okay? So let me talk to you about three visible visible thinking routines that you're very familiar with. Maybe you have uh, done this under different names, but I know you know how to use them. So see, think, and wonder. Ever heard of this one? Yes, I'm sure you have. So whenever we are working with books, like Ellie Publishing books, you look at a picture, you see the picture, right? So you look at the page of the book, there is a picture, you see, then you think about it, and then you wonder, right? Very similar to a very popular routine that we use as teachers, right? And then you share with someone. Uh, does anybody know what I'm talking about? So I'm going to ask Sylvia to help me. There is a routine that we use all the time when students have to look at something, get together and share. What is the name? So Sylvia, if anybody gives you the answer, you let me know. Okay, okay. Give, me, give me a second. Let me see. Okay. Okay, let's wait for a few seconds, like um, think, pair, share. Yes, there you go. And the Oscar goes to the person who got it right. I don't Simona, know. Alexandra. But I'm sure. <laughs> ah, see, a lot of people got it, right? Yeah. <laughs> because it's yeah. very popular. Yes, wonderful. Thank you, Silva. That That's it, you know. We use it all the time, think, pair, share. And you know what? I told you I'm a science of learning enthusiast. This has everything to do with the science of learning because whenever you ask random questions and then you don't allow time for your students to think and retrieve the answers, it's not very effective, you know. It's not very effective because there's something that we know it's based on the science of learning, so that means cognitive psychology and neuroscience. It's called retrieval practice, right? Or recalling. So whenever we get the chance to recall something yeah just try to bring that back to our working memory that means that we are strengthening the neuronal connections you know that's called long-term potentiation the problem is when we say who can tell me what this is and then somebody does it and then you know there's always someone who does it first right and then the other students didn't have the chance to think so it's best to say hey see Think individually, wonder, and then share. So that's one visible thinking routine, right? The other one, I like this one very much, make a claim, identify support for your claim, and ask a question about your claim. So claim, support, question, right? So this is very much uh, aligned with uh, the scientific method, I, I'd say, right? Claim, support, question. That's excellent. This could be done for more advanced groups, I guess, older kids, teenagers, right? And then finally, this one is very nice. And I think I would love for you to start thinking about this one because at the end, I might ask you to do it, <laughs> you know? So before you came to this session, you used to think that, right? But now after the session, you think that. So something has changed, but many times we just take whatever we, we have seen for granted, right? We don't actually test 
if we have changed our perception, our feelings, our you know knowledge, let's say. So this is a very important thinking routine that I think, see, I'm using thinking all the time. The word just keeps popping up. So th I think it's, it's something you should use more often, right? Let me give you more concrete examples. So see, think, and wonder can be used to introduce a new to introduce a new topic, right? So let's say you're teaching uh, vocabulary. I don't know, maybe you're teaching something like uh, fruits and vegetables, right? <laughs> so why not use this visible thinking routine? See, think, and wonder. So you show a picture of a vegetable, they look at it, they think about it, they wonder what it, what it is called in English. That's a very good way to do it. Or maybe it's um, a scene, it's a picture, of people on the streets doing something, talking, what's going on there, right? So I see I see uh, five people, they are talking to each other, someone is looking uh, at the house, so something is happening. So describe what you see, think about it, and then wonder what's happening, share with someone. So that's a very good way to make sure your students are thinking they're paying attention if they're thinking they're reasoning they're paying attention they're making new memories if they're making new memories stuff is getting inside you know they are working memory if it's inside their working memory chances are they will consolidate that at some point right it might take some time but if stuff doesn't even get inside their working memory because they're not thinking they're not going to learn as simple as that then you can use claim support question to practice and revise. So let's say you want your students to talk about, I don't know, something like present perfect. I think a lot of people in Brazil <laughs> have problems with present perfect, when to use present perfect. So let's say you introduce the topic uh, last week, and then at the beginning of this lesson today, you say, hey, I want you to tell me something about present perfect. So that's the claim. So I think present perfect is used for uh, life experience, experiences, you know? So when you want to talk about life experiences, okay, give me some support. So give me an example. Oh, okay, uh, I have traveled to Greece. Okay, wonderful. Now ask a question, and then you can ask a question to one of your peers, or you can ask a question about something you wonder about present perfect and so on, right? So that's a very good way for you to practice and revise things. And finally, I used to think, now I think you can use to consolidate things. Just like I told you at the end of the session, this is something we can do. So before the lesson, I used to think that I use this verb or this structure. Today I had a lesson with Italian students and uh, one of the students got married. So she's not a kid, right? <laughs> so she got married. So she used to think before the lesson that she gets married with someone, right? And I said, actually, you get married to someone or you get or you marry someone, right? Oh, so I could have asked her at the end of the lesson and she could have said something. I used to think that the preposition is with, but it's actually to. So I had no idea because it's different in Italian. It's different in Portuguese, right? Great. So let's talk about the wonderful books that Ellie Publishing makes, right? So this is one that I got, and uh, Michelle Worgan, by the way, she's an amazing professional. I have no idea if she's around, <laughs> but if you don't know who she is, follow her. Uh, I follow her on LinkedIn, I think on Facebook. She's always posting amazing things, so congratulations. And this book here kind of shows you. It's, it's part of the book, it's embedded actually. <laughs> so if you look at the, the activities, you have a lot of visible thinking there, visible thinking routines, right? So if you think about the first one, listen, look and point. I'm telling the student how to think about this. This is see, think, and wonder in a way. It's a different version, you know? So listen and point or listen and check, right? Look, at, look and complete. So we have a lot of visible thinking in books. This is very important because it makes our job easier, folks. It doesn't mean you have to follow exactly what the book gives you. I think the book is our wonderful friend, a guide that helps us, especially when we are pressed you know, for time, because we're always pressed for time because we're teachers, I guess, right? 
So if the book gives you the, the formula, let's say, the recipe, so just follow it, but then add your spice, your seasoning, you know, because you are a creative teacher, you have different ideas, but the book is already based on visible thinking routines, not all of them, not all the great visible thinking routines. At the end, you can always add, I used to think, but now I think. How many of you, for example, work with uh, exit tickets? right? Think about it. Or passwords. So at the beginning of the lesson, students line up and then they give you a password to get in the classroom, right? What about at the end of your lesson? There could be an exit ticket. It could be, I used to think, but now I think. So what have you learned today? It's a visible thinking routine. We just don't know the names, I guess. So sometimes we are using them, but maybe not as intended. So we can learn more. So here, is my invitation for you to check out Project Zero by Harvard, Nelson Goodman, Visible Thinking Routines, okay? Now, what does that have to do with visible learning? So visible learning, a lot of people have problems with, I would say, I have some problems with visible learning because I know John Hattie put together too many studies, some of them were not very good, <laughs> and that kind of messes up you know the results because he looked at more than a thousand a thousand meta-analysis you know so methodologically speaking there are some problems there but still i think the idea of visible learning is actually perfect you know it's like see learning with our own eyes see it happening in front of us that's wonderful now if you are familiar with his work you know that he calculated the effect sizes of many different influences and he classified them and uh if the influence is above 0.4 that means it's in the zone of desirable effects which means that those things really help you learn now okay what are you talking about in there well basically visible learning has a lot to do with making learning more concrete, more tangible, and using the stuff that actually makes learning more effective, you know? So that's what visible learning is about. Visible learning is not assuming that students have learned, but actually making their learning visible, right? It's so everyone can see that they have learned. And that's very different when you assume that someone has learned and when you can actually see that someone has learned, right? And there are many different influences here. I'm showing you what I'm sure is not an updated version of his influences. As a matter of fact, I studied this book. So this is the book I got from 2012, Visible Learning for Teachers, uh, quite hard because it was part of my dissertation, my master's dissertation. So here he discusses 150 influences, 150 influences. I just wanted to bring your attention to homework. <laughs> Take a look at that. Homework doesn't seem to influence learning that much. Yeah, because we're doing homework the wrong way, maybe. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a second. But what really, really works, look at that. Collective teacher efficacy, uh, student expectations, response to intervention. Yeah. So if there's an intervention, how will students respond? Will they actually embrace the feedback and do things differently or not. The, the ones that I like the most are student efficacy, teacher clarity, and feedback, okay? Now, we are going to discuss this a little bit, but I will focus on concrete examples, right? So if students are thinking visibly, you can see that they're thinking, that means that they're on the right path to learning, right? But then how do you know if they have learned? How do you check if they have learned? Well, that comes to assessment. That brings us to assessment. Remember, we are working in reverse, right? Where we started, so we, we think of the outcomes we want, then what, what is the evidence that we need to say, hey, they have reached the outcome, and then we plan the aims, you know, the objectives. Well, assessment is right there in the middle. That's how you collect evidence, folks, you know? collect evidence with assessment. But what kind of assessment? Well, if you want to read something cool, I, I know uh, the author, 
uh, personally, <laughs> you know, he's, he's a friend of mine. So he wrote this for the Mind Brain Education uh, Think Tank. It's Mind Brained, and the title, so you can just Google there, what are we assessing and how does it impact our students? Shifting to assessment as learning, okay? So some of you have ever, have you ever heard, and now I'm gonna ask Sylvia to help me again, because we are approaching the end, I'm gonna give you some examples. But have you ever heard of assessment as learning? I just need a yes or no, okay? So let's see, Sylvia. Okay, let's wait for a few seconds. All so right. Our, our teachers can get the time to answer. Can ah. you maybe say again the question? So yeah, has, has anyone ever heard of assessment as learning? Assessment as learning? Yes. 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 I've got a few. Okay. Yes. 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 <laughs> no. Okay. Also no. Okay. Okay, good. I mean, yeah, that's perfect, Sylvia. Thank the you. Yeah, some people said have... yes, I would say yes. Okay. The majority said yes, that's great. So I think so you're familiar with this, and I talk about this in the text, but I want to kind of change this a little bit because I told you at the beginning uh, that Robert Bjork, this cognitive psychologist, says that learning and performance, they're different things, right? Yeah. So I think that what we are assessing most of the time is actually performance, <laughs> you know? And be honest, you don't have to answer in the chat box, but just think, I just want you to think. You have learned, air quotes here, you have learned a lot of things in your life at school, but have you really? Do you still remember them? <laughs> or were you, well, good enough when it came to the test, right? So you were able to perform. So if you have forgotten those things, you haven't really learned them. If you cannot retrieve those things, you cannot say, hey, I have learned this. I was exposed to a lot of things. You know, I remember my physics and chemistry classes. I, I, I told you I was a nerd. I still remember a lot of those things. I don't remember everything um, because I haven't really learned. I, lear I learned temporar temporarily for the test. <laughs> but now if you ask me, so depending on what you ask, I won't even remember I studied that, <laughs> okay? So that's a problem. Anyway, so assessment of performance is what you can remember that day based on what I gave you as a teacher. I gave you the content, the input, and then there was a test, and the test was made by me, and I chose the questions, the focus of the test, and that's how you performed. It was good, it was bad, it was excellent, it was terrible. So that's your performance. If I apply the same test, guys, I'm not kidding. So folks, listen to me. If I apply the same test, the next day, your grades will be different and a lot worse, probably. <laughs> if I apply the same test one week after, your grades will drop like big time, okay? Yes, that's what the, the cognitive psychology evidence and you know science of learning tells us really but then we have assessment of learning so assessment of learning is very interesting because it's what you can remember when you are free to think and i'll give you an example in a minute so it's not me giving you the test i made all the questions and no i mean unless there are open-ended questions then you can really show but this is like what have you learned and then you tell me and you show me right Okay, great. But also, there's assessment for learning, and then we are approaching assessment as learning, right? But I'll stop here because you can read more about assessment as learning in the text I showed you. But this has to do with a continuous formative, formative process to steer your learning. So it's not really looking at a test. I'm not saying tests are, are bad. I'm saying we cannot rely only on tests grades numerical grades and what i'm saying is that if you assess for learning so if you focus a little bit more on formative assessment you can help your students ace the tests they can actually get better grades that's what i'm saying that's what the evidence is showing so to wrap up and then we have questions right to wrap up i'll tell you three stories to prove my point okay 
So the first story I want to tell you is that many times we apply tests, you know, and tests are great. There are many tests that we have to take. It's part of, of life. It's, it's a process. We have to take tests. We have to prepare for tests. Yes. But many times we rely on tests alone to say that someone has learned something or not. But the question here is, do exams really show us learning? Not necessarily. How many times have you as a student actually thought, uh oh, I studied everything, but the teachers asked the wrong questions. The teachers asked questions I didn't study. Have you ever felt like that? Probably. So I studied really hard, but that question I wanted the teacher to ask was never asked. <laughs> and then you get frustrated, right? Yeah, because we don't know what questions will be asked uh, on the exam. So that means that you have learned, again, air quotes, something, but you didn't have the chance to show it because it was never asked. How sad is that, huh? <laughs> Maybe you haven't learned, by the way. Maybe in two, three days, you will forget everything. But what I'm trying to show you is that tests, when they not they don't add a free or open-ended question, they are incomplete. You know, I know we like to to use multiple uh, choice nowadays more because it's easier to uh, correct. But you know what? How do you change that? I'll give you one example, concrete example. So let's say you prepare your test, or there is a task that the students have to do, an exam, whatever you prepare the questions or the questions come with the book and the book is great for that. It's all done for us, right? But why don't you add one question that should go like this, you know? Is there anything I didn't ask you that you know and you would like to show me? Huh? How about that? Yes, and then you give them points for that, all right? So that's one way for you to see their learning. Yes, Sylvia? Yes, I'm here, I'm here. That's oh, okay, okay. Right. Yeah, 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 I, I'm here. I, okay, I thought you wanted to say something. Great, great. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I was just reading a few comments, but I will share with them with you later. They're really, really interesting, if you like. Okay, great, great. Please do read. Uh, so we're going to finish in a, in a couple of minutes, and then you can read, right? Great. Yes. The next story, is, and, and by the way, so this is another great book you know, by Ellie Publishing. And so I, I don't know if you noticed, but the books are preparing kids for a major exam. <laughs> you know, the Cambridge exams, right? A major exam. And that's excellent because it helps you with the framework, with, uh, you know, the structure, with similar activities. That's very, 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 uh, I mean, that's amazing. That's really something that they have to do. So it, it kind of, simulates the test in many ways right but the problem is not the book the problem is you teacher or are we we are the problem sometimes because we don't make the book alive you know we don't make the book alive so we are if we are constantly preparing students for written exams and you know oral exams but we are not helping them apply the stuff that they're learning in re relevant contexts then we're not making their learning visible. Not, and it's not visible uh, to their parents, to us, and to them. So one of the things you can do, you know, the homework that you assign can be much more related to their context, you know, to their family. So the book gives you the idea. The book, again, saves our lives, right? It gives you all the ideas, you know, the topics, the content, the skills, but the application when, how do they apply that? I'll give you one example. My students had to teach their parents how to cook in English. So they, so they had just, again, fruits and vegetables, right? They had just learned fruits and vegetables. They had to come up with a recipe and then teach their parents how to cook using those words, okay? So that was fun, it was great. If they are too little, if they're very young learners, they cannot cook, they can observe. You know, and then they can teach sort sort of point and tell the names, you know, of the, the fruits and vegetables there on the table. They can do that. And you can film that, right? That can be homework, for example. So you are helping students integrate what they're they're learning with their daily routines, with their families, 
their families can actually see their, their learning and everybody everyone is more satisfied you know so you have to do that it's not just about simulating things for a test for an exam because after the exam they might forget right if it's only for performance if it doesn't stick it's not learning but one thing that really works projects folks you know i love projects i've done a lot of projects i told you i was going to introduce you to mr trunk so say hello to mr trunk my stuffed elephant hi everyone if you are curious about mr trunk you can follow his hashtag on social media so i'm writing here in the chat box now it's mr trunk travels so if you go to instagram or facebook and you look for mr trunk travels you'll find almost 300 pictures of this guy mr trunk because this made visible made learning visible to me because some students who didn't engage who didn't do much in class they took mr trunk for the very first time to their uh homes and they took pictures they make videos they made videos and for the first time i saw them actually using english uh with their parents uh using the pictures to create sentences anything you can imagine you can do with mr trunk and now i don't have just this one stuffed elephant you know i have well it's it's an elephant but i also have the owl because of my book the owl factor so say hello to athena athena is the city athena i learned in greece a couple of months ago is the name a person's name a woman's name right athena so you can have a mascot for the lesson based on what the book gives you use mascots to create amazing projects okay if you're teaching older students you can get some inspiration here instead of uh telling my students to do things in a very specific way i just told them what i wanted them to do but the layout the format the type of of medium they chose they chose okay so if they're old enough and they can do that you will have amazing results for example we were talking about they are grown-ups right or or teenagers they are actually all grown-ups and then they had to talk about emo you know emotional intelligence uh bilingualism you know things i was teaching at the university and instead of telling them you have to write a paper you know or you have to record a webinar or whatever they decided to use their creativity. So one group made an infographic. So this is actually very, very, it's just a, a, a small part of a very long file that shows statistics and everything about emotional intelligence. And the best one was this one. One group decided to use The Sims, The Sims to create a video game, you know, of a bilingual school. So they actually designed the school and you could walk so there was a virtual tour inside the school they used the video game to talk about how this room will help students develop their emotional intelligence you know so now to finish i think the message here is if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one around to hear it does it make a sound so if something happens but we are not looking did it did it exist if, if it's not visible, if we didn't use, it doesn't have to be only our eyes, our sight, but any other sense to actually say, hey, this happened, did it happen? So the problem is that we have too many students to deal with. I know, but we have to collect evidence and evidence is not just grades, it's not just written homework, pedagogical do documentation, drawings you know posts on social media whatever it doesn't matter uh a video of them preparing dinner with their families i don't care that's evidence you know that you can measure you can say hey they're actually using what they learned you know and to wrap up really one of the greatest things about uh netflix and you know all those streaming services is that you can re-watch your favorite movies again and again right I don't know if you knew that, but I rewatched Grease re recently because I was watching something and then Grease just popped up and said, hey, you know what? I'm going to watch it again because I like John Travolta's, you know, K 
character, you know, how he sings. I mean, he's, he's actually a horrible person, but then he gets better. Anyway, and you know what I saw? I had never seen this. What do you see? So I, I'm going to ask Sylvia to, to help me. What do you see in the scene that catches your attention that is actually pretty amazing? So let's see if you can write that in the chat box. Okay, let's wait for a few seconds. Let's see. Yeah. Let's see. Okay. That's, I do. Okay. Ha happy people. Uh, people together. Joy, happiness. Yep. Also laugh. Yep. Definitely. Happy time. Great. Sharing moment. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, you know what caught my attention? that I had never seen before. I've watched this movie many times. This the guy shirt. is doing the also pink shirt. <laughs> oh, okay, the pink shirt, John Travolta's pink shirt. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, take a look at this guy. He's actually doing like a front flip, you know, like a handspring. Mm -hmm. Take a look at this guy here. I mean, that's pretty amazing. His name is Vince Fontaine, the character in the movie, Vince Fontaine and he was a host and he was uh, hired by the school to do the ball right to talk about the dance and everything mm -hmm. and uh the actress ed burns ed burns i watched this movie so many times i was not looking i was not paying attention i had never seen that before last week this is the first time really you know in in, in one week that I've, I've shown this to anyone and my question now is has anyone ever seen this before you know, I don't know, probably not. This is a very, very nice illustration of, you know, when you're not looking, when you're not looking, when you're not paying attention, you are going to miss things, you know? So making learning visible has a lot to do with recording, collecting evidence so that you can look later. If you cannot look at, at it now, because you don't have many eyes, you have many students, at least you can record something to look at later you know because every time you look every time you look you will see something different just like this guy flipping right in front of you the climax everybody getting together can you imagine how risky this was this guy didn't tell anyone ed burns the american actor he didn't tell anyone he was going to do that but then he flipped somebody through the microphone he catches the microphone take a look at that so he rehearsed, of course, right? But nobody knew. And that's exactly what visible learning is about, like looking for the details, but sometimes looking for what's very obvious right in front of you, but you are missing because you're not collecting the evidence and you're looking the other way. That's it, folks. Now time's, time for questions. Thank you very much. I hope this was useful. And I'm here, Sylvia. <laughs> Yes, okay, so thank you. Thank you so much, Andre. Really, really interesting. Uh, and it's true. Um, I used to think some, some things, but now I think <laughs> other new, I've got a new perspective, <laughs> <Great. laughs> I have to say. <laughs> yes, proof, definitely. That's proof that she was <laughs> paying attention thinking about. Thank you especially, very much. <laughs> especially concerning the details. So uh, there are yeah. many, many, many comments. And I'm afraid we haven't got much time left. But there was one in particular, one teacher um, so was mentioning something about the fact that when talking about assessing and even, let's say, yeah. judging the, the performance you know, of the student, it's important for, for teachers to consider uh, the emotional yeah. barriers as well. So nowadays we, we hear a lot about you know, the social emotional learning, for example. I mean, and not only yes. for talking, we, we are teaching to pupils, but also I would say to young adults and adults as well, because it's a, it's a matter yep. of, you know, uh, the way the, of feelings. So everyone has got feelings and an you know, emotional attitude. Mm -hmm. yep. I couldn't agree more. Yes. Uh, that's why, you know, self-efficacy, uh, which is one of the influences for John Hattie, has a lot to do with being emotionally and cognitively able to accomplish the task, you know, mm. you organize uh, your things so that you can you can get where you need to get, basically. So, if students are are cognitively okay, uh, you can separate those things. Actually, cognition and emotion are always together. But 
we can control, we can use cognition to control emotions and emotions can control cognition. So if you're not ready emotionally, even though you know, you cannot perform well. And then, so how many times have, have we experienced that as, as students? We knew it, we knew yeah. how to do it, but then we got so, I don't know, incredibly anxious or nervous during the lesson or the, the test that we just failed, right? Mm. But we knew, we knew it. <laughs> we have to take that into consideration. But yeah, yes. definitely. Mm. There's one teacher uh, yeah. I'd like actually to thank. She, her name is, uh, I hope I can pronounce it correctly, it's Nadezda. Uh, of course, for privacy, I'm not saying the surname. But anyway, she's, uh, when talking about exams, she said that exams are like photos, like uh, pictures of a moment. On yeah. the other side, on the other Perfect. hand, the teachers really need a video. So what's or, or the whole process of the, of, the, of the activity? It's really interesting. I really like this sentence. It's sort of, you know. Nadezda. Thank yeah. you. If, if I have your permission, I, I will start using that now in my <laughs> sessions, okay? <laughs> thank you. So I used to think, but now I think. So thank you. That's for me, okay? <laughs> Great. So I've got, um, okay, let, we've got time for a question, I would say. Um, so, okay, for example, what types of um, assessment should we pr prioritize when making learning visible? you mentioned different yes. types of so that's, that's yeah that's the big question i think uh i think we're still very much focused on written assessment you know so because we we assign homework and what's homework students have to answer some questions write something uh, in the class they have to do that and then the test is is a written test or an oral test you know but it's much more focused on written assessment i think nowadays with the technology we have we can change that a little bit, you know? So we don't have to give them high stakes, summative assessment all the time, like, you know, with grades, no. I think the point here is that we can assign more formative types of assessment, like, you know, I, just, I mentioned one, and I know a lot of people are from Italy here. So you probably know Maria Montessori. You probably know Loris Malaguzzi, you know? And I think they are two great sources of inspiration, but to me anyway, and they work with the idea of pedagogical documentation. So what is pedagogical documentation? You collect everything or that your students do and you create a portfolio. So portfolios are, are a very interesting way. So if there's a drawing, if there's a video that you made of your students doing something, if there's an audio file, you know, when they said something, if there's a, a, so a picture of something that they put together, like a, a model that they, they built, you know, so all of those things go uh, a, a, as part of this portfolio. It's hard for you to give a numerical grade for that, but it's evidence showing you if they're learning or not, because they are applying the stuff that they're learning. So that can happen simultaneously as you are assigning, you know, so the written homework, yes, the tests, the exams, okay, everything is working. Everything at the same time. But simultaneously, you collect other types of evidence to say, oh, they are really learning. Because maybe if they study really hard, they pass the exam. But where is the evidence from other sources that they are actually learning something? So I think uh, portfolios, like I said, projects and pedagogical documentation, that, that should be and they all start with P to make your life easier. So you won't forget. Portfolios, projects, and pedagogical documentation. Okay. Thank you, Andre. Well, I, if you go, okay. yes, please. Yeah. Just, a, just your comment uh, from another teacher, uh, Mohammed, saying that uh, um, to read the thinking of someone else, someone is more, much more difficult and it's not visible thinking we can actually predict or uh, assume. That's true. So that's why you have to look for evidence, <laughs> like I said, you know. So when somebody's thinking, they are, there are two things you have to look for. It's diligence or think about engagement and uh, commitment, you know. So when somebody's thinking, they're looking at something, they're listening to something, they're paying attention, you can tell. Maybe they're daydreaming. Maybe they are, but then they have to give an answer. 
If they give an answer that makes sense, then they are thinking. So that's why we, we should use um, concept checking questions instead of assuming that students are thinking about something. I've just shown them uh, this new word. So did you get it? That's a bad question. So what was the word I just gave you? Give it to me, you know. That's evidence that they were thinking, they were paying attention. If they can answer, that's evidence. You cannot simply assume, you cannot have a feeling that they're thinking. You have to test if they're thinking. You have to collect evidence, experiment, poke them a little bit, you know. That's the only way we can tell. Otherwise, yeah. it's like uh, the dragon and Carl Sagan, you know. Maybe there, there's no evidence whatsoever, and then it doesn't make sense, you know. They're probably not thinking, yeah. Thank you. So uh, I think we've reached the end of this session. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to thank all our teachers and of course, André, definitely for your um, for your participation to this event. Thank you so much. Very appreciated, very inspiring. And I'd like to remind all our teachers to download um, the PDF, the handout that André has kindly put together for you. It will be very good for you to keep it for your archive and, you know, knowledge, of course, and study. And remember to follow us on uh, Facebook um, so that you will be able to, to watch the recorded video of this uh, workshop. And uh, well, thank you then. Thank you all and see you next time. Thank you thank very you. much, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, it was a pleasure. And remember my to pleasure. go to my website, andre-hadlund.com. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.